the word astrophil uh, it, it is derived from uh, this word star you know astro from star and here we can see sydney calling himself a stargazer and stella which means star is none other than his beautiful beloved penelope now what i find very interesting is that in the name philip sydney you have that p h i l already uh, put in and when he names his sequence he names it astrophil and stella hello and welcome to nibble pop today we will be looking at a very popular sonnet which is prescribed by almost all universities in the undergraduate programs of english honors students love this poem and it's more or less simple but there are certain elements in the poem which i wanted you to focus on so stay with me till the end of this video as we go through this beautiful sonnet by sir philip sydney loving in truth and if you haven't subscribed yet you might consider subscribing to our channel to stay connected and get notified every time a new video comes up this is mona mukherjee welcome once again in november 30 1554 in kent england a child was born to henry sydney henry sydney was a knight so he was called sir henry sydney this child grew up to be the person who we now know as sir philip sydney although he was not born into a royal family as such but his family belonged to the nobility his uncle was the adviser to queen elizabeth and his father was lord president of the wales as expected sydney attended a very good college he went to christ college under oxford university but before completing his studies he went off on a great tour of the continents so this was a general tendency you know milton also he went to uh, europe uh, after completing his studies um, and this was because uh, europe although england is very much part of europe uh, but england is like an isolated island europe provided a kind of exposure especially countries like italy greece uh, france the exposure which finally enriched english people and they brought those elements down to their own country this was more effectively seen during the renaissance philip sydney was no exception when he returned from england he became the cup bearer to queen elizabeth it's a very prestigious position now that went on for 2 years after 2 years he was sent as an ambassador he went to germany and upon returning he became a very politically powerful person and at the same time became a patron of arts he became a member of parliament in around 1580s in 1585 he was appointed as a governor of the dutch town of flushing one year later he went on to this battle against spain a spanish battle and eventually died because of his battle wounds sydney is considered to be uh, one of the very prominent uh, poets of his period of the time when he lived but interestingly uh, poetry was not something or literature was not something he entirely focused on uh, many people consider him as uh, the greatest courtier because of his uh, noble behavior uh, however people also thought that he was quite arrogant and independent minded he was the one who wrote the first elizabethan sonnet sequence astrophel and stella and the poem which we will be looking at today is the first sonnet of that sequence other than that he also wrote arcadia which is a heroic prose romance he is also famous for his literary criticism work the defense of poetry where he talks a lot about aristotelian concept of drama and his defense of it 
he shared his work with his friends, but during his lifetime, he did not publish a single thing. So far as Astrophel and Stella is concerned, we do understand why he didn't want them published in his lifetime. Astrophel and Stella, the sequence was composed sometime around 1580s. It is a sequence of 108 sonnets and they were addressed to a woman named Penelope. Penelope Devereux, who became Penelope Rich after marrying uh, this person, Rich. Now, it is believed that Sidney uh, had a chance of getting married to this woman, but things didn't turn out well and she got married off to somebody else, after which Sidney realized how much he loved her and how unreachable she has now become. And she has become like this star at whom he can simply gaze but he cannot reach up to her. So this sequence named Astrophel and Stella is like his offering to this woman. The word Astrophel, uh, it, it is derived from uh, this word star, you know, Astro from star. And here we can see Sidney calling himself a stargazer and Stella, which means star, is none other than his beautiful beloved Penelope. Now what I find very interesting is that in the name Philip Sidney, you have that P-H-I-L already uh, put in and when he names his sequence, he names it Astrophil and Stella. So naturally, we understand that this entire sequence is autobiographical, although Sidney creates a persona, a narrative voice, the voice of the stargazer. So the person speaking to us in this sonnet, which we will be reading today, is not entirely Sidney. It's that stargazer, Astrophil. We already know what a sonnet is. It's a 14-line poem. And sonnets are usually uh, divided into octave and sestates if they follow the Italian pattern, uh, which was popularized by Petrarch. And so far as Shakespearean sonnets are concerned, we see that uh, the sonnets do not have an octave sestate pattern clearly defined, but we do have a concluding couplet. That is, uh, a pair of rhyming lines at the end of the a whole poem which kind of summarizes or concludes the poem. So when we will be reading this poem, we will not just look at the theme but also the structure of the poem to understand the different kinds of influences on Sydney when he was writing this and the kind of innovations which he was making. This was the first sonnet in the sequence. So this is kind of an introductory sonnet where his giving a kind of introduction to what this sequence is going to be about and how he is going to write his poems. Loving in truth and fain in verse my love to show that she, dear she, might take some pleasure of my pain. Pleasure might God her read, reading might make her know, knowledge might pity win and pity grace obtain. So this man who is writing this poem gives us the purpose of his writing. He wants to write uh, in order to impress his lady love. Loving in truth, the love that this person feels is genuine and he wants to show that honesty, that genuineness of emotion to the lady love. So he wants to show his love through his verse, through his poetry. Why does he want to do that? Why does he want to express himself in poetry? That she, dear she, so he does not name the person here, but he just uses the pronoun she, might take some pleasure of my pain. Now, when he is using the word pain, uh, there is uh, an element of pun here. Uh, he is using his pen to write the poem. And then this woman, she will feel pleasure because of what he has written with his pen. And here pain also means the effort 
the trouble, uh, the way in which uh, he has taken the initiative to write. That is the pain of writing. A third way of looking at this word is to understand that this man is feeling pain because this woman is away from him. And when this woman will read this poem, she will understand that he is in pain and she will feel pleasure because poetry is supposed to give you pleasure. And she might feel good that somebody is suffering because that person is away from her. So that is going to give her a flattering feeling and she might feel pleasure. In any case, his target or his aim is to win the attention of this woman. So he will write, she will get pleasure by reading. Pleasure might cause her read. So when she will find pleasure from this verse, she will concentrate on the words. She will start reading more carefully. Reading might make her know. So the more she uh, will read my words, the more she will understand my emotions for her. So this is his plan that I am going to uh, make her feel attracted towards my writing and after that she will start reading my words and eventually knowledge might pity win when she will know about me she will start feeling sorry for me oh dear this man loves me so much and she will really be open to the idea uh, that she should uh, somehow accept the love of this person and pity grace obtain now this word grace it has religious connotations you know yeah, when you associate this word grace with god and god's blessings uh, so for this man this woman is so precious this woman is so divine that getting her love is as divine as getting the blessings of god and getting the grace of god so uh, we have this very powerful word used here so what is the sequence of events that this man is uh, anticipating or thinking would happen she would find pleasure in his pain and then she might start reading and then knowing him and then will feel sorry for him and eventually start loving him so this is why this man wants to write a whole sequence of sonnets or poems but there's a problem here and he tells us about the problem now. I sought fit words to paint the blackest face of woe. So I wanted to make my poem filled with images of suffering so that she would know I'm suffering so much. I'm having so much woe and she will feel so much more sympathy for me. And for that, what did he do? Studying inventions fine. I went on studying different kinds of poetic forms, different ways of expressions of previous poets, of classical poets, her wits to entertain. So I wanted to entertain her sensibilities, her wits. So I wanted to be very smart in my writing. And in order to be smart, I studied a lot of poems. Of turning others' leaves. This is what you all do, right? When you want to write a very good answer, you go on to this Google search and you go through pages and pages of answers written by other people and you somehow dig so much deep into those answers that you eventually start feeling frustrated. You don't know what to do about it. The same thing happened with our Philip Sidney or our Astrophil here. Of turning others' leaves. So, um, others' leaves means literally uh, pages uh, from books written by other authors, authors, greatest authors who came before him, to see if thence would flow some fresh and fruitful showers upon my sunburned brain. Why did I do this? So that somehow, if they can inspire me, because right now, my brain is dried up and he uses this very peculiar image as if his brain is sunburned. Now, just a few minutes back, I was telling you that he is looking at his beloved as if she is a star, Stella. Sun is also a star. 
So does he mean that his beloved is consuming his senses so much? It's as if she is burning his brain down and he can't think straight. He is suffering through a very miserable phase, the phase of a writer's block. And he is wishing to have some fresh showers. So he's using a very beautiful metaphor here where ideas are equated with rain. So in these four lines, he gives us his strategy and why he is doing this, why he is looking into other people's works. And then he talks about the problem he is facing there. But words came halting forth. So when he went through these other people's works and then he wanted to write something on his own, then he was not able to have any kind of natural flow. His words were halting, not coming naturally, not coming spontaneously. Wanting inventions stay. Invention means imagination, a creativity. He wanted his creativity to stay, to stay focused on what he was doing. But no, it was a halting process. It was not coming as smoothly as he wanted it to. Invention. Now he is defining invention for us. Invention doesn't mean scientific invention. Here invention means creative invention or ability to imagine and create uh, something uh, which, you know, great literature uh, creators do. That is invention. He is defining invention as nature's child. Invention, nature's child. Fled, step dame studies blows. Now what he was doing here? He was studying. What was he studying? He was studying maybe Iliad, Odyssey, Petrarch, uh, classical things to inspire him. And because of so much study, invention, which is basically child of nature, something very spontaneous, something which you're born with, that is feeling oppressed. And because of so much study, that invention is running away. So you have this image of a child whose mother is nature and stepmother is study. So what does a stepmother do? A stepmother is stern, uh, is beating. So invention, the child uh, runs away from this uh, study and therefore he cannot hold on to his invention or creativity because he is studying so much. So you see, Instead of being a help, it becomes a hindrance. So instead of making him empowered, the literary predecessors, the writers who came before him in history, they were basically holding him down, not letting him break free through imagination. So this is what was happening to him. And others' feet still seemed but strangers in my way. See, it was my life or it is my life. And if I take help of others' words, then I can never write the story of my life because he understood that every life is lived in a personal way. This idea of personalization uh, that we are so familiar with in the age of Google, this is something he's talking about. That my poetry has to be written by me using my words, having my imagination, not following blindly the dictates of others. I will have to reinvent something. So he's again using this beautiful image. Thus great with child to speak and helpless in my throes. So he had this whole stock of feelings, emotions inside him as if he was pregnant with emotion, he was pregnant with idea, but he was not able to deliver them. It's compared to a situation where a pregnant woman uh, is bearing a child, but she's going through uh, the pains of labor, but has not yet given birth to the child. That is a super powerful uh, metaphor that he is using here. But yes, if you have such intense feeling, 
inside you which you want to express and you feel that the greatest masters of literature even they can't help you out it's you who need to deliver your baby and that poetry is your baby then yes this metaphor is very much pertinent and justified biting my truant pen so his pen is acting like a truant truant is these naughty boys who run away from school uh, who don't listen to instructions so his pen is not following his orders so he's biting his truant pen he wants to write something nice remember he himself was a little bit of a truant because he went off to europe before completing his studies so maybe he uh, very much wants to use this word truant biting my truant pen beating myself for spite i'm so angry with myself what am i doing I can't write what i feel and then suddenly something happens fool said my muse to me look in thy heart and write muse the classical goddesses who inspire poets in general muse may refer to any person who inspires a poet here it might mean his beloved who is probably speaking to him in his imagination and what does his muse his inspiration tell him don't look at others don't look into books written by others look into your own heart and write you simply write what you're feeling and back in those days you know the word heart was often used uh, synonymously with mind so it's not as if the muse is telling him that uh, don't think about things just write what you feel not that look into thy heart means look inside your thoughts formulate your own thoughts and by the time he puts that final full stop we do have a 14 line poem already written down the writer's block is unblocked while writing this poem this is something which happens uh, in a very uh, modern poem too maybe some day we'll discuss that together the thought fox he describes the fox and he he says as if he is very you know uh, uncreative at the moment and while describing the fox suddenly at the end of the poem he says and the white page is printed so what is this poem about this poem is about love of course it is it's a sonnet it's addressed um, or to stella of course it's about love but what is the core theme of this poem the theme of this poem is not love the theme of this poem is poetic creativity and the problem of poetic creativity as i was telling you this is the first sonnet so this introduces the poet to us in some way and the poet wants to tell us that he is a genuine person an honest person and he wants to be innovative he follows this 14 line structure so where is the innovation here thematically this follows the tradition of courtly love in courtly love tradition Uh, you have this figure of lady love uh, who you cannot attain in your life she is like this goddess sit on a pedestal you're worshiping her and um, she is not even looking back at you and all your life your target is to somehow serve her that is courtly love so from the look of it uh, the persona the narrating persona in this poem is talking about that kind of love devotion so this follows the idea of courtly love or the tradition of courtly love so we cannot say uh, sydney is very innovative here so where is his innovation while we were reading this poem you must have noticed that i was stopping after every four lines i did not stop after six lines or eight lines so there is no octave sestet division in this poem what we have is you know three quatrains four lines and then a concluding couplet this was before shakespeare so sidney was using shakespearean style before shakespeare started using it 
Now that's because this style was not invented by Shakespeare. The idea of concluding couplet, it was there before him. And Sidney was simply following it here. So we have three distinct quatrains talking about three different things. In the first quatrain, what do we have? He is giving us this idea about why he wants to write a poem. In the second quatrain, he wants to tell us what strategies he is taking to find fit words. In the third quatrain, he is telling the problems he is facing when he is trying to look inside the pages written by others. And he is making these beautiful images down the line. In the final part, in fact, in the concluding couplet, couplet means the rhyming uh, lines, he gives us a conclusive statement. Statement one, he is biting his pen, that means he is frustrated. And statement two, his muse tells him to be spontaneous, to write from the core of his heart, something which William Wordsworth talks about in his preface to the lyrical ballads. So many years after Sydney wrote. So there is an element of romanticism in Sydney. Is almost talking like romantic poets. That one should be close to nature. One should be close to their own instincts. And not to study. Or not to uh, mechanically uh, put in elements from other people's works. Okay. So Sydney is a... Uh, you can see he professes originality in writing. The second thing where I see him very innovative is that uh, he is not using the usual 10 syllable line in his sonnet. Usually sonnets have 10 syllable lines. You know, they are written in iambic pentameter. Uh, pentameter is 5 and iambic feet is like disyllabic foot. So, 2 into 5, 10 syllables are usually seen in sonnets. In his case, we see uh, they have 12 syllables. So, hexameter of him. Okay. So, here he is being innovative. And this idea you know, as 12 syllable lines are called alexandrines. And use of alexandrines is not very common. So, this is one innovation you must mention when you are talking about Sydney's uh, new way or novel way of writing sonnets. When you look at the rhyme scheme, because he already does away with this octave sestet idea, there is a mix of Italian and Shakespearean uh, rhyme schemes. Now, when you look at this poem, this is very strange because uh, the rhyme scheme goes like this, A, B, A, B, again because uh, this word W, O, E, it rhymes with show and no. It's called wo. Uh, and then flow again matches. So we are going to put again A, B, A, B. So normally in a sonnet, we would have had A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. Then E, F, E, F, G, G as in case of Shakespeare. What he does is he makes the first quatrain and the second quatrain Continuous rhyming, you know, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, like that. So, show pain, no obtain, woe, entertain, flow, brain. They are packed together as if uh, he is condensing them. Instead of saying A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, he is doing A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. And therefore, when we have in Shakespeare, E, F, E, F, instead of that, what do we have here? C, D, C, D. Because C is not used yet. So it comes down to A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. And then finally, E, E. So in Shakespeare, we have G, G. In concluding couplet here, we have E, E. Now that is because Sidney uh, was very much capable of handling rhyme. And although English language is not very suitable, uh, as a language which helps with rhyming, Sidney somehow had a good vocabulary so he could manage to condense the first uh, two quatrains uh, with a similar rhymes. So this is more like Shakespearean sonnet in rhyme scheme. So do we have a break of eight and six lines at all? What comes at the eighth line? Let's look at that. At the end of the eighth line, that is the end of the octave, 
if this was a an octave sestet division you notice there is this word but so there is a turn there is a turn so this is both shakespearean because it has that rhyming couplet a concluding couplet at the end and at the same time there is a turn turn or volta but words came halting forth so he is giving a situation in the first eight lines and then he is giving a reaction to that situation in the next six lines so this is a unique blend of petrarchan and shakespearean elements italian and english elements and this is where sidney stands out so this man from the very beginning has been innovative and he has shown that the best creation is possible only when you decide to personalize things because there may be so many stars in the universe but when you gaze at a star you can look at just one star and for him that star was a defining force and her love was so powerful maybe because she was so unavailable that he really wanted to create a difference by writing what nobody else has ever written i hope you have enjoyed reading this poem with me today do write down in the comment section if you want me to cover any other sonnet that is there in your syllabus and i also want you to watch the video exclusively made on sonnets which is already present in my channel so if you are watching this on 30th november let's close our eyes and remember this astrophil philip sydney who was born today i see you all in my next video till then stay happy stay subscribed this is manali mukherjee signing off bye bye